Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, delightful to be with you this Lord's Day. What a beautiful sunny morning. A lot easier to get up on a morning like this and come, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know about you guys. We had a lot of cloud in Chicago uh, last month. Um, great to be with you. Thankful to you, Scott, and to Ray, and to Jim and others who invited me this weekend. Really nice to be with some of you last night. Good to be with you this morning, and looking forward to worshiping with you as well. CPC Wheaton sends their greetings, and uh, it's a joy to be with you this morning. I am married to Jen, um, and she sends her greetings. I really wanted Jen to come. She wanted to be here, but some kid stuff going on this weekend, so she couldn't be with us, but she sends her greetings to you. We're a blended family. We have five kids in total, four girls and a boy, so life is busy and uh, chaotic. So last night was a very peaceful night for me, I must say. And uh, yeah, it's just great to be with you. So what I want to do is just share briefly a bit with you about what our ministry is, who we are, and what we do, and how we do it. And then I want to make this a bit of an interactive time in the Word of God and just kind of give you a taste of what we do in workshops with pastors. So I work with a ministry called Word Partners, and we're based out of Palos Heights in Illinois. We've been around since 1970, started out as a one-to-one -one discipleship ministry. And about 15 years ago, we grew and morphed into what we do now. And what we do is we train pastors around the world to preach expository sermons. And expository sermons are what you're very wonderfully hearing from Scott each Sunday. And expository is just a fancy word for saying we want to teach God's word with God's intent. So it's not the pastor coming up and teaching you what he wants to talk about or taking a verse and expanding on it for 30 minutes, but actually opening the Bible with you and helping you to see what's going on there, what's being said, why is it being said, and how did it apply to God's people then and how does it apply to God's people now? That's what expository preaching is. And we do that because most of our work is in the majority of the world, where pastors don't have access to good education, they haven't had exposure to good biblical preaching, there aren't often resources and materials translating their language for them to study, and so we want to come and serve them with the know-how we have and the education we have, and we want to serve them and empower them and equip them to preach the word of God faithfully. And why do we want to do that? Because God creates the world by his word. He saves you by his word. He grows you through his word. You grow in godliness through his word, right? Paul says in Timothy, God's word, all scriptures, God breathed and is useful for correcting, training, and teaching, and rebuking in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so it's our conviction that all scriptures God breathed and it brings life and transformation. So when I think about our ministry and what we do and my ministry and what I do and why I do what I do, I go back to Genesis. And for those of you who heard me last night, forgive me for saying this again, but um, Genesis 1.1 is critical for me. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And how did he do it? By speaking. And when God speaks, something always happens. And when he spoke into the void in Genesis 1-1, where there's a void and there's darkness and there's nothingness, and God speaks into that void, he brings life. He brings beauty. He brings order. He brings transformation and glorious things. When he speaks the gospel into the void of our hearts, he brings beauty and life and transformation. And he turns us upside down to make us right side up, doesn't he? He forgives us of our sins. He molds us into the image of Jesus. So we believe and have a conviction that God's word brings life and transformation. And because we have that conviction, we long to see the word of God flowing powerfully through every church to every nation. We long to see men of God's in pulpits whose hearts are captivated by their love for the Lord Jesus Christ who believe with us that the word of God brings life and transformation, and they want to be prayerful men who study the word and preach the word so that churches and homes and communities and countries change. And thus, we're fulfilling the Great Commission to make disciples of all nations. And how do you do that? By baptizing them and by teaching them to observe all that Jesus commanded. So word ministry is at the center of all ministries. So that's a little bit about why we do what we do. How do we do it? We will work with a group of pastors, usually 15 to 20, 
and we get them together in a workshop. So for example, I'll go to Poland next month and we'll have 15 to 20 pastors in a new workshop. We invite them to spend three days with us and we'll open a book of the Bible and we do what was called principles. We're giving you the principles for how to interpret and teach scripture faithfully. So we'll do Jonah next month, for example. I know you're preaching through Jonah right now. So what's the genre of genre, or genre of Jonah? And how do you read that? How do you interpret it? And how do you preach Christ from Jonah? I mean, he's not explicitly in Jonah. So how do you preach Jesus from Jonah? Is Jonah just an historical book that's kind of neat about a guy caught in a whale, or is there something more? What does it have to do with us today? It's this really ancient book. Does it have something to do with us today? Is there a message for us today? So we're working through that. And we have eight principles, some of which I'll share with you in a few moments. And we have these working principles in the workshop. So we come up front, we'll share, here's the principle of genre and how you read what you're going to read. And then the guys will do group work. They'll show us what they got to grow in their handling of the word. And then they'll also give example sermons and we'll give them feedback on the sermons. Here's where you did well. Here's where you could grow. That was helpful. Still need to work there. We'll meet those guys for three days, twice a year for four years, because the truth takes time. And it takes time to grow into this kind of preaching. Scott, were you able to preach like that right out of seminary? Oh, sure. (laughs) That wasn't the answer I was looking for. (laughs) I couldn't. (laughs) It's a lifelong process, right, of learning and growing. So you don't just come out of seminary and you're a great preacher and you know how to apply the word of God to people. You stumble and work your way through it, but through patience and working the principles and praying and being exposed to people who can help you and train you, you come along. And the growth trajectory we see from the very first time we meet until the end of four years is absolutely phenomenal. It's amazing how much guys grow in their preaching. And it's also wonderful to shepherd them and encourage them Most of the pastors I work with in Eastern and Central Europe, Russia, Ukraine, or in Haiti, they're bivocational pastors, meaning their church can't pay them. So they're working a normal job during the week in the secular world to put bread on the table. Saturday is writing a sermon, and Sunday is church, and maybe there's adult Sunday school. So it's really hard to do ministry in that environment. Usually they're alone. The churches are often small and struggling. Often the economic circumstances aren't the best. It's stony ground they're breaking, so the spiritual growth and the numerical growth is slow, and it's hard. And so the temptation to quit is great. And so to spend three days with these guys, laughing with them, studying the word together, praying together and encouraging them, gives them the strength to keep going and to not quit and to not give up for ministry. But in 2 Timothy's words, to suffer for the gospel, to guard the gospel, to continue in the ministry and to preach the word all the way heavenward. So we do things with a spirit of encouragement. And we also want to empower them. So we're not coming in as experts. I'm Sean Martin and you know, just listen to me and write notes for three days and I'll tell you what to do. It's not a seminar, it's a workshop. So we're coming in with the spirit of a servant and I wanna show you how to do what I do by equipping you. And we believe that the same spirit that called us and equipped us is the same spirit that calls them and equips them. They have the gifts, it's just a matter of having the tools and the know-how. And as we're training them how to preach this way, we're also training them to become trainers. So by the third and the fourth year, we're actually giving them sessions to lead so they can start teaching because you learn best by doing the teaching and training yourself. And by the time we finish the fourth, and, or the fourth year, the eighth and final workshop, they actually lead the whole workshop. So my goal through the four-year process is just to move to the back of the bus and let them drive the bus. Because it's their country, it's their culture, it's their language, it's their context, it's their network. They'll be far more effective than I'll ever be. And my network over there is very small, but their network to hundreds of people. It's their community, it's their people group. And so they'll be more effective. And that way, the ministry grows. So in Ukraine, for example, we started working in Ukraine 10 years ago uh, with 20 pastors and forests in Ukraine in a place called Poltava, which is occupied right now by the Russian army. We started 10 years ago with a group of about 18 guys. And in Ukraine, there are over 12 groups now of almost 300 pastors being trained from east to west and north to south. And because of the war, I can't go to Ukraine but it doesn't matter, God doesn't need me. They're doing the work. 
And even if I could never go to Ukraine again, the work in the ministry continues because they've been trained in the spirit of 2 Timothy and they're training others and the work becomes exponential. And so the greatest story of how it can be exponential is Brazil. We started working in Brazil, I think in 2009, 2010 with the first Baptist church in Achabaya near Sao Paulo. Again, a group of 20 pastors. The Brazilians have gone on to train over two and a half thousand pastors in Brazil and expository preaching. They've even done church plants in the Amazon basin. And then they said, well, there's not just Brazil. Portugal speaks our language, and so does Mozambique and Angola. So now the Brazilians are preaching missionaries going to Mozambique and Angola and Portugal, and they're training them what they learned in Brazil. And so the movement becomes international. Now, we didn't have that goal in mind. I always say we weren't smart enough. But God knew. And God always does infinitely more than we can ask or imagine, as Paul says. And he's done that. And so the ministry has grown and grown and grown. And so in God's kindness, we're in about 40 countries around the world on five or six continents. And God's been very kind. And it's very simple. There's no silver bullet. There's no magic. We don't have a special new book. Do it this way and your church will get bigger. It's the same ministry the apostles were doing. It's prayerfully bringing the word of God to people and watch God do what he does. Isaiah 55, 10 and 11 says what? As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, you know this verse? And does not leave it empty, but causes it to bud and flourish. So there's seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth, says the Lord. It will not return to be empty, but what? It will accomplish everything I desire. So when I'm preaching, I'm always praying that verse as I walk up to the pulpit. Father, I thank you that no matter how unsure I am about my sermon today, or maybe I didn't feel like I could prepare as much as I wanted to, I know that as I prayfully open your word with people this morning, you're going to do exactly what you want to do through your word. It's your great promise. And so as God's people, we can have what I call Bible confidence, that every time we open the Bible, we're confident God is speaking and he's going to do exactly what he said he's going to do, and he's going to do what he wants to do because his word is unstoppable. It brings life and transformation. And so all of us, including the pastors we train, have to ask ourselves, do we still believe that? Do we still believe that God's word brings life and transformation today? Maybe we see a barrenness in our own hearts. Maybe we see a void in people we've been praying for for years, and it just feels like there's nothing happening. Or we wonder about the spiritual state of our churches or our country or what's going on in the world. And when we have those moments where we face the void and ask, can anything change? We need to go back and remember God's promise. My word will always achieve what it is our to achieve. It's unstoppable. It's effectual. And it's irresistible. That's why we do what we do. So what I want to do now for maybe 10 or 15 minutes of Q&A is I want to give you a little taste of what we do in the workshop. So we teach these principles. And the first principle we have is what we call staying on the line. So it's kind of like you've seen the courthouse movies where there's a courthouse and someone stands right at the stand and they put their hand in their Bible and they say, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God, right? We all know that one, right? So when you're in the courtroom and you're a witness, you're called to stay on the line of truth before the judge, right? You tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Well, we have that principle. It's the first principle we teach pastors, which is your goal when you're preaching is to stay on the line, meaning staying on the line of Scripture. So from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, when you're preaching, no matter what book or passage you're preaching, your job is to stay aligned and to teach the truth of God's word, the whole truth of God's word, and nothing but the truth of God's word. So at the beginning of the Bible, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, Moses says, do not add or take away from the book of the law, or curses will come upon you. You do not add to God's word, you don't subtract to God's word, you stay on the line of God's word. You get to Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19, and the word of God says, do not add or take away from this prophecy or you will not be able to eat 
from the tree of life. Really serious stuff. So we're not to go above God's word and add to it. We're not to go below God's word and take away from it. When you go above God's word, you have what? Legalism, right? Do this, don't do this, do that, don't do that. Taste this, don't taste that. Touch this, don't touch that. You have legalism. That's the Pharisees, right? They added to God's word, 613 laws. I can remember 613, let alone do them. And Jesus rebuked them, didn't he? Matthew 22, he said, Woe to you, Pharisees. You make these followers, you're twice a child of hell as yourselves. You give people a burden that they can't lift. And then what happens when you go below the line and you take away from God's word? Liberalism. Well, did God really say that? He doesn't really mean that, does he? Well, this is a culturally bound text. It doesn't apply today. So in Matthew's gospel, we had the Sadducees who went below the line. They didn't believe in the resurrection. And Jesus rebuked the Sadducees as well. And he says, woe to you, Sadducees. He said, you do not know the word of God. You don't know. Because the word of God speaks of the resurrection, doesn't it? And so Jesus rebukes them. So we need to stay on the line of scripture. We don't want legalism. Legalism is a terrible stain on the gospel and is a distortion of the gospel of grace. And we don't want to fall into liberalism and license because that also is a distortion of the gospel. Holiness and righteousness matters a great deal to God. We're not to take away the things that make us uncomfortable. We're to receive the whole word of God as it is, the word of God. So that's the first principle. And the second principle we'll ask is, well, what gets in the way of staying on the line? And the biggest thing that gets in the way is our second principle, which is we call text and framework. So the text, the Bible, is king. It's God's word. So that means all of us, all churches, were under the authority of the word of God. The Westminster Confession makes that clear, doesn't it? We're all under the authority of the word of God. But the reality is we all have what we call a framework. There's nothing wrong with having a framework. Your framework is your approach to life. So growing up, you had a framework about how you start your day in the morning. You don't even think about it, but there's a certain process you go through when you get up in the morning that you probably learned from your mom and dad. It's just, this is what you do when you get up in the morning, or this is how you work, or this is how you look after the house, or this is how you cook and clean in the kitchen. It's a framework that you learned. There's nothing wrong with having a framework, and everybody has one, but what happens is our framework affects our approach to scripture. Your framework for the Christian faith comes from the teachers you had. Maybe how your parents taught you about the faith. The pastors you've sat under, the books you read, the music you listen to, the podcasts or the lectures that you listen to. Your denomination even has a framework, right? We all have a framework which is an approach to scripture and it's okay to have a framework, but we want to make sure our framework isn't over scripture and we want to read things into it that aren't there. So when we come to the text, our framework can stop us from staying on the line. So for example, in Ukraine, one of their frameworks is, is if you're a Christian, you're not allowed to dance. Period. No dancing for Christians. So we're reading the Psalms together and we're reading Samuel and David's dancing before the ark. I said, well, guys, I see David dancing here. What are you gonna do? We don't dance. I said, okay, if you don't wanna dance, don't dance. But it's here in the scripture. What do you wanna do? We don't dance. Dancing is not okay. So you can't dance with your bride at a wedding? No, dancing's not okay, but it's in scripture. So when your framework collides with the text, you always have a choice. You can say, nope, that doesn't fit with my understanding. It doesn't fit with my framework or my denomination. Or you can submit yourself to the authority of scripture and say, I've learned something new today that's challenging my thinking and I need to adjust my framework to what scripture says. So that's the second principle. So then we ask, well, how do you make sure you're finding out the text is king 
and you're teaching the text and not your framework. And that's where working principles come in, where we'll do things like, how do you ask good questions of the text to find out the meaning? How do you study the genre? How do you find the structure of a text? How do you find the main idea that the author is conveying and then preach that in a message? How do you find the application for God's people today? How do you preach Jesus from the Old Testament? You're in Esther, for example, and God's not mentioned once in the book of Esther, so, oh my word, how do I preach Jesus from that? Well, you can, but it's gonna take work. And so that's what we do. And as these pastors learn these tools, They're starting to preach the word of God and their hearts are changing, their preaching's changing and then the church changes and families change and communities change. It's extraordinary. So we do Mark's gospel at the end of our second year and one pastor in Serbia said, what's been great about this workshop is not only have I learned how to preach Mark's gospel faithfully, but he said, I just feel like I spent three days with Jesus again in Mark's gospel. And he said, my heart is so refreshed and so encouraged by him. And I'm reminded of my call to him. And I'm reminded of my call to preach him and teach him to people. And I'm going to go home and I'm going to preach Mark's gospel to my church. And I can't wait to refresh my people the way I've been refreshed by Jesus as he walks off the pages of Mark. That's what it's all about. So let's do a little interactive thing. If you've got a Bible or a Bible app, open up to Jonah with me. You can. If you can, that's okay. You can follow along. Let's look at Jonah for a minute. I know you're preaching through Jonah. Don't worry, Scott, I'm not going to preach. I'm I'm tempted to, but I won't. (laughs) Okay. So we were talking about text and framework a moment ago, right? Everyone's got a framework when you come to Scripture, whether you're aware of it or not. So let me ask you a question. If you ask most people, what is Jonah about? What do you think they'd say, typically? It's about Jonah and the whale, right? Yeah, Jonah and the whale. That's the typical thing, right? That's the book of the whale, and it's all about Jonah and the whale. And I've seen kids' books with Jonah and the little belly of the whale, and usually they only cover chapters one to three. They never talk about chapter four, interestingly, because it doesn't fit with their framework, right? Okay, so we say that Jonah's about the whale. Let's do something together. Let's just ask some questions of the text, which is one of our principles. We want to stay on the line, right? How many verses are in Jonah? Could someone add them up for us, please? Shout it out if you got the answer. 48. Okay, 48 verses in Jonah. We're agreed? Okay. Let's look for a moment. How many of those 48 verses mention the fish? So where do we first see the fish show up? 117, right? Yeah. The Lord appointed the fish. Okay. And then when do we see it next? 2, 1, the belly of the fish. And then when do we see it again? 2.10, okay, so three verses mention the fish, right? So let's do math, how many, what's the percentage? Three out of 48? About 6% roughly, right? Okay, so here's a question. If 6% of the book mentions the fish, is it about the fish? Is it? No, right? The fish is a vessel or a prop on the stage. It's, It's something God uses. But it's not about the fish, it really is it. Well, how does the book begin? The word of the Lord came to Jonah, right? So the word of God comes to Jonah, and God speaks to Jonah, and Jonah runs away, right? And God pursues him, okay? So that's how the book begins. Turn to chapter four. How does the book end? Who are the characters? Jonah and and the Lord, right? So the book begins with Jonah and the Lord having a dialogue, and the book ends with Jonah and the Lord having a dialogue. And in the middle of it is Jonah's running away, and God is pursuing him. That's so encouraging, isn't it, right? That's one of the things I love about this book. This guy is wayward and disobedient and rebellious, but God keeps pursuing him all the way to the question mark at the end of the book. That's wonderful, isn't it? Our God is a God who pursues us. So it's not about the fish, 
but it begins and ends with Jonah and God, right? Now look beginning at chapter one, verse one. It says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah saying, arise, go to Nineveh, okay? Do you see that again? Chapter three, verse one says what? Yeah, doesn't it sound similar, right? So chapter one, verse one, and chapter three, verse one are pretty much the same, except for the first time and the second time. Same word. So in a way, that's your book divide, right? One, one, and three, one are the big divisions of the book. And it begins with God and Jonah, and it ends with God and Jonah. And then in the middle of it, you've got the fish, right? And him going to Nineveh. So what's going on here? We have the Lord, and we have this wayward prophet. And Nineveh is in there because God cares for the Assyrians. He made a promise to Abraham that he blessed the nations, meaning the Gentiles. God cares about the nations. Where's Jonah's heart? Where's this guy's heart? You, you're looking at chapter one, I guess a couple of weeks ago. Who prayed on the boat? The pagans did. The prophet didn't. Isn't that surprising? That's a good question to ask. What's surprising? The man of God runs from God, and the man of God won't pray. In fact, he'd rather be thrown over a boat into the sea than pray. And that makes you say, wait a minute. What's going on with this man's heart? And then he gets to chapter four, and everything looks good. If it ended at the third chapter, it'd be a happy ever after book, right? He goes a second time, and he preaches, and they repent from the king to the least. Everything's great, but you get to chapter four and you go, oh my goodness, where's this man's heart again? Are you angry? I'm angry enough to die because I knew that you're a merciful Lord, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and I knew you might do that to the Ninevites. That's one thing to do that for us, your people Israel, when we worship the golden calves, but the Assyrians... That's another thing entirely. And he's quoting Moses in Exodus when God had mercy on them after they worshiped the golden calf at Horeb. Jonah knows God's character, but where's his heart? So you see, we're just digging a little bit and we're seeing it's not about the fish. So now we have to ask, well, but my framework's about the fish or I was taught it was about the fish. So am I going to go, no, 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 it's about the fish, or am I going to go, I need to adjust my framework a little bit because as I dig into the text, I'm seeing the fish is just a prop. This is about God and the man of God, the prophet Jonah, and the Assyrians to a degree as well, right? That's what's really going on. So if I'm going to stay on the line to preach Jonah, that's the line I need to preach. Yes, I'm going to talk about the fish, it's there, but that's not going to be the main thing. We're going to be talking about God, who's the hero of the story. We're going to be talking about Jonah, who's the anti-hero of the story. We're going to talk about the surprise that pagans and Ninevites and sailors become people of God and the prophet keeps running. We're going to ask ourselves, where's my heart? Do I share God's heart of mercy for the nations? Are there people in my life or countries that I think are undeserving of God's grace like the Assyrians were? And that's going to help us stay on the line and teach what the text says. And as we apply that, it brings great power. So that's a little bit of what we do, just a little taster. I think I'll stop there. It's about 1030, and I want to have some time for Q&A or interactions or any other thoughts on Joan or maybe, Scott, there's something you want to bring up. So, yeah, let's open it up. Yes. Yeah. The approach that you have that must stay on the line in the scripture. Yep. If you look around this room, there's lots of women in here. Yeah. And not a single one of them has their head covered. Mm-hmm. And that's what Paul tells us to do mm -hmm. in the scriptures. Yeah. Why do we throw that out as if it's not there? Mm. It's a great question, Scott. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
It's so funny. I, I just, I'm laughing. This just came up the other day. Someone brought that up. We talk about women's ordination and the head coverings always come up. It's a really, it's a really tricky one, right? And you know, the, the short and easy answer is it was a cultural thing that went on at that time in the first century. And other people say, well, if that's cultural, then why isn't everything else cultural? It's a difficult one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's difficult, yeah. Other questions, comments? Yeah, Ray? You said that you drew, I believe it was eight books in your workshop. Yeah. So how, how do you select books? Yeah, so, so one thing we want to do with the eight books is we want to alternate between the Old and New Testament, and we're pretty heavy on the Old Testament because a lot of pastors, that's unfamiliar territory for them, so most pastors are comfortable in the New Testament, and that's what they want to preach. And we want to make sure they're teaching the Old Testament because that's also God's word. And we want to show them how you can preach Christ from the Old Testament. Because in Luke 24, he says the whole Old Testament, Moses' law and the prophets point to me and speak of me, right? Um, so that's one part. And then we alternate. So in year one, we do Jonah and 2 Timothy. And then the second year, we do Genesis and First and Second Samuel. In the third year, we do Mark and Habakkuk. And the fourth year, we do the Psalms and Hebrews. So you're learning all kinds of genres. How do you preach an epistle? How do you preach prophetic narrative? How do you preach the, the law of the Pentateuch? How do you preach a gospel? How do you preach an epistle? So they're learning to handle different genres and all pastors will have certain genres that they're more attracted to or that are easier for them to preach. And we wanna make sure they're comfortable and able to preach the whole counsel of God because that's our call, right? Um, and in the first year, we specifically do Jonah and 2 Timothy to shepherd them. We do Jonah because so much of it is a heart book, right? And there's a lot of repentance on the third day when we do reflection because pastors will say, I'm just like Jonah. I don't share God's heart of mercy. There's people I'm angry at that I don't want to pray for. I have no evangelistic fervor. Pray for me. So it's a real heart book and it surprises you. It catches you off guard a bit. And then we always do 2 Timothy in the first year because, as I said earlier, a lot of pastors are wanting to quit in the developing world because it's so hard. And 2 Timothy is a real rally cry to suffer for the gospel, guard the gospel, preach the gospel, keep going in the midst of suffering. And it keeps a lot of guys from quitting and gives them the strength to go on. So there's a shepherding and a pedagogical reasoning behind the books in the book order. Yeah, okay. Yes? Yeah, so we started in 1970 with our founder, Bill Mills, who, who went to be with the Lord a few years ago. And Bill started it as, a, as it was called personal discipleship ministry, so kind of like the Navigator movement of one-to-one -one Bible reading. It started as a one-to-one -one Bible reading ministry, and it was probably like that for a decade. A lot of people came to faith through Bill's ministry, and then churches started inviting him to come and speak and teach people how to disciple and evangelize. And it kind of morphed into a conference ministry. We were starting to do conferences at churches, and then eventually pastors were saying, we really need help training pastors in developing countries around the world, how to handle the scriptures well. And so at about 2004, 2005, that's when we switched to the current model we have, which is traveling abroad and training pastors in expository preaching. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. It's non-denominational. The, the ministry itself is non-denominational. So we work with, our, our approach is, Anyone who wants to come and study the word of God with us, you're welcome, right? And God's word will do the work of God always. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So what is the um, sort of training that the missionaries that go? Are they all graduate from seminary? Yeah, so all of, all of us who do the training are pastors. Yeah, we're all, we're all ordained pastors. We've all done our MDiv. So, yeah, there's an educational le level you need and also experience in pastoring that you need as well. So you're able to... You were on their level, right? Do they have a special training like what's the education? Because I guess these people are pastors too, right? Yeah, so the guys, the guys we train, many of them have not had exposure to a Master's of Geneva Bible College. Some have been to a Bible college or had some level of education, but often they don't. It depends. So in Poland, the education level is high. So all the guys there, I mean, I, in my last group, I had six PhDs, <laughs> which is kind of daunting. But I go to Haiti, for example, and often it's high school or a little bit after high school. So the education levels are massively different. So you have to tailor your training, right? And how high level you are, depending on who your audience is. So it's a real mix. But often in the developing world, they haven't, they haven't done anything like an MDiv or anything like that. Yeah, so it varies. So it's wonderful to bring what we have and to share it. Yeah. Yes. Do you have groups of people in Africa and in the Middle East 
Yeah, we do. We're in about, I think, uh, 10 or 11 countries in Africa, and we're in three in the Middle East. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, Jim. Oh yeah. What's that, what's that connection point? What's the give and take? Great question. Yeah. So, so as I mentioned earlier, we're training them how to do the training right through the four-year process. So in the third and fourth year process, we're always praying and looking at, are there three or four men in this group who kind of really rise to the top in the sense they're a leader of leaders. They really love what we do. They're passionate about it. They're already multiplying it and training other people in it. And I'll bring them and develop into a national team. And so I'll start working with those guys and mentoring them and spending some days with them before the workshop to help them get ready. And then when that group graduates, they're the ones who will lead and start the new groups. And so after the four years, I continue to meet with them twice a year and I'm developing them, coaching them and getting to the next level in leadership abilities, resource abilities, and then the training abilities as well. So I kind of become less, in the beginning, I'm much the trainer and the director. And then I'm moving much more to the consulting and coaching mode and I'm just kind of helping you along. So our role has to change as the group changes because we want to empower them and, and equip them to go and do it. Yeah. Are there questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah. And now it seems like we're recognizing that discipleship comes by the word preached. Yeah. And uh, it seems like there's been kind of a shift. It, it does. I, I, it's a good question. I think that my own view is that anytime you open the word of God and with people, you're discipling them. So Pastor Scott, you're discipling people as you preach the word of God, right? Which you're going to do shortly. But a parent who's reading the Bible with their children, you're discipling your children. If you're having coffee with someone in the, the, work, uh, the coffee shop and you're reading scripture together, you're discipling one another. If you lead an adult Sunday school class and you're opening the Bible, you're discipling. So I would argue there's many ways that Bible discipleship can happen, and preaching is the primary one, but I still do one-to-one -one ministry. I meet guys for coffee and we read the Bible together to grow one another in, in the Lord and to, to pray together and encourage one another. That, I believe that's discipleship ministry as well. So I do both. Yeah. Yes. So do you find in each class or maybe the, when you look at these frameworks, um, do you find that you often butt up against, almost in each case, butt up against sort of certain frameworks that, that cause resistance? As yeah. As doing in your, so my brother teaches uh, theology in Kenya near, near Nairobi, so again, that comes with a certain set of presuppositions and ways of interpreting and goes back to when the missionaries came over, they planted their churches this way. <coughs> Yeah. To go and set up certain theologies that become heavy set in that region. So then it's like if you try to teach something that didn't fit in the, say, you know, dispensational framework of eschatology or some, something like that, right? And so you run up against an issue, and it's like, and even in their institutions, they don't sort of, you know, they require you to sign very detailed statements of, of faith that meet their local frameworks. And, and so it just keeps capitulating. So he finds all the time, he's like, he doesn't agree with all the frameworks. He's, yeah. trying, to teach, he's trying to teach hermeneutics and Bible yeah. study. Yeah. And there's a lot of like, he says it's a blessing because they're, you know, eyes open, they see maybe something different, but he has to almost do it like somewhat secretly because he can't overly be too explicit of like challenging someone's framework. But it's, you know, it's, it's an interesting element of how, how you run up against that. Yeah, you do. So for those of you who can hear, the question was, you know, what do you do when you run up with different frameworks from different denominations? How do you handle that when you butt up against them, so to speak? And yeah, we do all the time. And so I call our approach a, a by-the-way approach. So yes, I come from a Reformed perspective, right? That, that's my theological stance. But I work with lots of people who don't have that stance. And so the approach is by the way. So I don't come in and go, I'm Sean Martin, I'm Reformed and Presbyterian, and I believe in covenant theology, and you should too, and let's go at it. Because if you do that, you're going to put people offside right away. My attitude and belief is the word of God does the work of God. How do the reformers come reformed? By studying scripture, right? And the spirit through his word changed their thinking, right? And their living. So I just say, let's get in and open the word together and read the word together. 
And the scriptures take care of a lot of that because the guys will grow and their frameworks will change if they're open as they read the Bible. And yeah, sometimes we butt up against stuff and so we'll have healthy, robust conversations. Usually around baptism, at some point they'll start teasing me about being a pedo baptist And we have, but by that point you have a good relationship and you're able to laugh and wrestle in a brotherly way and agree to disagree. But we have a by the way approach and the other thing we have on our side is time. Because for all of us, the truth takes time to change our thinking and our living. God is very patient with us. And so we want to manifest his character of patience. And when you meet someone for four years, twice a year, and you're building a friendship, you're building relationships and trust, people are willing to listen with you and wrestle with you. And we see lots and lots of change and growth in biblical understanding and growth in theology and teaching as a result. And some things you just... You know, like baptism, we disagree to disagree on it, and that's okay, but we continue on in our fellowship in other ways. Is that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes, you and then you. Yeah, the language barrier, I mean, it's, it's difficult in the sense of I wish I could speak with everybody because some guys speak English and some don't, right? So what we do is we want to make sure that for them, all the training is in their heart language. So all of our curriculum will be translated in their heart language. So everything they read is in their heart language. And then I'll always hire a translator to translate me. So they're hearing all the training and teaching in their heart language as well. So it slows things down and it's kind of tiring. <laughs> so when I finish... And I got in the United plane and the stewardess comes up, you know, would you like a beverage? I'm like, oh, English, thank you. It's, it's so nice. It's tiring. So it's difficult, but we're able to work around it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, how do you start to work in a new place? You have to have context. Yeah, thanks for asking that. So partnership is the lifeblood of our ministry. The quality of the work so much depends on who we're partnering with in a country. So here's Poland as an example. Uh, we were at a con- an evangelical conference in Turkey, and the president of the Baptist Union was there. We met him. He heard about what we did, and he said, I'm kind of curious. Maybe what you're doing could really help our church. So I flew to Poland on my way to Russia, spent a day with him explaining the ministry. Let's pray it over. He invited me. He said, okay, we want to hear you preach at our pastor's conference And if we feel we can trust you, we might let you train. So then I came in and preached at the pastor's conference. And then they said, okay, we want to do a project with you. And then we sit down and work out resourcing and who's going to come. And then that partner is really the key way, the entryway into the country. And he knows the people to invite. He'll have the place where it's going to be hosted, where people are going to stay, and then away we go. So the partner you choose is really, really critical. So we don't do cold calling. All of our work is through partnerships and friendships. People hear about that. Oh, we heard about that training. Can you come and do with us? That's how we work. Okay. So I'm back there. I think I had a hand up. Yeah. Yeah, there is. So, so they all want to use Facebook Messenger. So between the six months, you know, they'll be texting me on Facebook and I'll be texting them or we'll have a video meeting. Hey, I want you to talk about my sermon or I'm having some marital troubles. Could you help me out with that? Or a guy will call, I've got this really difficult pastoral issue. Can you give me some counsel on that? So my relationship continues through the year. And as years go on, I mean, we become very, some of these guys are very close friends. I stay in their homes. They visited me and we spend time together. So we, do, we definitely want to make sure in between the six months, we're keeping in touch. Now that varies. Some guys don't have English. And so, you know, you do a little bit of Google translating back and forth. Hey, how are you thinking about you? Can't wait to see you again. And then some become very deep relationships. But yeah, the relational and shepherding aspects are very important for what we do. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. I just want to say it's really encouraging and inspiring to about the work that you're doing. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I feel like I have a handle on how America has changed over the last maybe 20 years or Yeah. So. Yeah, it's a good question, how the rest of the world has changed. So I was mentioning last night, you know, uh, we've been working in Ethiopia for about 10 or 15 years. And in Ethiopia, the statistics say that 19.6% of the Ethiopian population is in a Bible-based church on Sunday morning. That's one in five. That's extraordinary, right? That's really, really high. And in a lot of African countries, the church is growing. The preaching and theology isn't always the best. So there's been a lot of rapid growth, but not always the strongest theologically and biblically. Europe is really, Ernie and I were talking about that earlier, early, er, Europe is like rock hard ground. So people tease me like, oh, you get to go to Europe, like that can't be too bad, right? And yes, it's more comfortable traveling there than Africa, 
<clears throat> but spiritually, Europe is a wasteland. Less, far less than 1% of the population would be an evangelical Christian. So Europe is very, very, very secular, and I feel we're going the same way. So lots of missionaries are going to Europe, not just from the States, but from Africa. And the Middle East Christians are going there to evangelize and do missions work in Europe, which is great. It's kind of sad. It's the opposite of what it was up until 100 years ago or so, right? So it's really, um, it's really hard ground. And so that's why it's necessary to keep preaching the gospel and teaching the word of God over and over and over and keep raising up the next generation to do, to do the work, right? So in the Middle East, it's, the church is growing fairly rapidly. In Iran, the Bible is the most popular book. And the underground church in Iran is growing strongly. In Lebanon, it's not bad either. But then you go to Morocco, and it's super tiny. Or in Turkey, uh, out of 85 million people, they estimate there's 6,000 Christians. Out of 85 million. So Turkey has a huge need. Yeah. yeah. I think we're just about out of time, right? Maybe one more? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's, yeah, that's a good question. What, what percentage does it mean are in reach? I'm not sure. I don't know. Yeah. But I know our partner in Turkey told us they're considered an unreached people group because even though there's people who are doing mission work there, there's 6,000 out of 85 million. They said we're considered an unreached people. But I'm not an expert in that stuff, so I'm not sure what the stats would be here. Yeah. I think, I think I'm out of time, right? So thanks very much. Really great to talk with you guys. Thanks for coming. marvelous that you would use jars of clay to take your infallible and errant word out into the world and entrust the great deposit with us for your glory and for your kingdom. And so we continue to pray in the coming year that you would bless Sean and bless word partners and that we would continue to hear the gospel going forth and that many would come and believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So thank you for this time. Be with us as we come and worship you in spirit and in truth. Bless the words and the speaking of our pastor as he comes to us with your word. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.